fortunate and how blessed we are to be able to live, work, and to play in these beautiful territories. And really to thank those stewards of the land for taking care of these lands for thousands and thousands of years. My deepest appreciation for that. Um, as you know, we're here um, hosted by NNPBC, so I'm Sherry Kensel, I'm the board chair of NNPBC, and that's the organization that is the professional nurse of all four nursing designations. So really, we're all four nursing designations working together, and that's great. I'd like to introduce to you our um, new chief executive officer, Bernice Buds, and come on up, Bernice. And I uh, really thank Bernice for stepping into this role as our chief uh, executive officer. So we've all, many of us have known Bernice in a number of capacities, so we're super fortunate to have her be part of us here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being able to be here with us. Um, and again, just, you know, with it being a Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, and welcome to the NNBC. Certainly on a Friday afternoon with traffic and a little bit of weather to challenge, it sometimes isn't as easy to get together, but it's great that you're here. I know others are on the way and will be seeing them shortly. Um, as Sherry mentioned, I'm uh, new to the organization. I just uh, uh, started on Monday, so today's day five in the job. <laughs> so luckily, I can finally go this it's a little bit of a learning curve for me and some great opportunities. And then when I was informed that Dr. Chapman's coming today, I'm like, that's just excellent. We have the, the, the chief federal nurse coming on day five. <laughs> so I thought this is a great opportunity to connect. So thank you so much for coming. I think today is going to be a great opportunity to have some dialogue, really hear about some of the great work that's going on and will be going on going forward to support nursing retention. And so that's going to be uh, really a highlight for us. And I think for everyone here, that's not a new topic, but hopefully this will be one that we're really going to be able to get some great traction on. So it's really my pleasure to be able to bring uh, greetings uh, today on behalf of uh, the provincial uh, chief nurse, Zach McLishan. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us, but he does send his greetings. And if you haven't had a chance to meet Zach, we'll see if we can make those connections for you at some point too. And as you probably might remember, uh, Zach was a previous uh, president of the association as well, so that might be a familiar name to you from the past. So it's really my pleasure now to be able to introduce our um, new chief nursing officer, Dr. Leah Chapman. She was appointed in the role in August of 2022 and serves full-time in this capacity with Health Canada. As CNO for Canada, Dr. Chapman provides strategic advice to Health Canada to address pan-Canadian nursing priorities and represents the federal government in domestic and international forums. She also plays a convening role by engaging and collaborating with nurses from coast to coast to identify nursing issues and innovative solutions. Over the course of her career, Lee has gained a deep understanding of nursing through her work in both frontline and clinical leadership capacities. Her professional experience spans various settings and includes critical care, education, research, administration, policy, and advocacy. Prior to becoming the CNO for Canada, Liam was the inaugural Director of Clinical Services with the Inner City Health Associates in Toronto. Her work focused on strategic operational and clinical oversight of nursing services for people experiencing homelessness who were affected by the COVID-19 epidemic. In addition to her role as a CNO for Canada, Leah continues to practice as a registered nurse. By providing frontline care and harm reduction services at a community-based consumption and treatment site in Toronto. Leah developed a passion for working with people experiencing homelessness and for people who use drugs following the overdose death of her brother in 2015. Dr. Chapman received a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing and a Master's of Science in Clinical Health Nursing from McMaster University. In 2019, she completed her PhD at the University of Toronto. And uh, this is where she also did research focusing on competency assessment of clinicians practicing in academic hospital settings. 
Lee has been involved in the life-saving work of the Toronto Overdose Prevention Society and has been a director on the board of the Human, oh, of, sorry, of Harm Reduction Nurses Association. She's been recently profiled as one of Canada's top 10 healthcare innovators by Maclean's Magazine and was named one of the 50 most influential Torontonians by 2023 by Toronto Life. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Chapman here today for a conversation with BC nurses, focusing on retention and the issues that matter most. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chapman, Canada's chief nurse to the stage. Just going to situate the beverages here so you can monitor my hydration here. You know, nurses, we're, we're all about ins and outs, right? So, and I really apologize, my flight from Toronto was delayed. Uh, so, really, I'm grateful to see all of you here on a Friday afternoon um, and uh, delighted to um, be bringing greetings on behalf of the federal government. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly, I want to ensure we have lots of time for the rich panel that we have uh, following, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of the Federal Chief Nursing Officer because it was just reinstated last year uh, after more than a decade long vacancy. And, um, and I really want to talk about sort of what the role entails and what I've been up to since I've been in the role. Um, so when the position was reinstated, uh, Minister Duclos talked about the role um, being really influential in terms of influencing decision making within the federal government, within health policy, um, and also uh, recognizing the important voice that nurses play. We have the largest group of regulated health professionals in Canada with over, with actually I, I like to say uh, almost half a million nurses. Uh, it's better than saying over 400,000 nurses. Um, we round up, right? <laughs> so almost half a million nurses in Canada. And, um, I, you know, one thing that was quite interesting in, in this quote by Minister Duclos is that he said that I would play a key role in stabilizing the nursing workforce issues. And of course, you can imagine this is not the task of any one individual in Canada. The issues are complex. They are long-standing, and we have collectively a lot of work to do um, because the way of the way the profession has been so historically undervalued for so long. Uh, but I think it's really key to recognize that um, you know when the when the position was reinstated, it, reinstated it was the result of advocacy. So advocacy from the Canadian nursing community and advocacy from the international nursing community as well. Um, the position was eliminated under Harper's Deficit Action Reduction Plan in 2011, and it was really the voices of Canadian nurses that led to the reinstatement of the role. Um, so never underestimate the uh, power of nursing advocacy in influencing government, because I think um, the reinstatement of the role is really a testament to the advocacy paying off. And about 78% of countries around the world have a government chief nursing officer. Sometimes it's combined with a government chief nursing and chief midwifery officer as well. Um, I think you've heard a, a lot in my bio. You've certain this is. Uh, I've been a nurse for 20 years now, just over 20 years, um, in a variety of sectors, and I think I've really found my passion in working with people who use drugs and people experiencing homelessness, which is work I've done since about 2017. Um, and I think. Um, um, I, I had a real um, sort of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity over COVID, once-in-a-career, I guess, opportunity over COVID uh, to develop a nursing workforce from scratch. So that was the, the work uh, with Inner City Health Associates, which is a physician services organization in Toronto, was a physician services organization. And in 2020, they got a bolus of COVID funding and, and the um, provincial government said, develop a nursing workforce, for, for, workforce from scratch. And this was in the height of the first wave. So you can imagine hiring nurses in an organization that had never ever employed nurses, uh, developing clinical services in hotels, um, which was new to everyone, unless nurses had provided care for uh, refugees and, and newcomers to Canada, and really kind of retrofitting the hotels as well to be hot and cold spaces. We needed to decant these large 
um, homeless shelter, shelters for people experiencing homelessness because there was no ability to self-isolate. Um, and then caring for people experiencing homelessness was new for the majority of nurses, and COVID was new for all of us. So it was uh, a really um, exciting time. Now looking back, it was stressful uh, because we had about 17 days, including weekends, to be fully operational in a 24/7 facility with uh, nurses. And uh, over time, we, with with short in short order, we actually introduced nurse practitioners, and it became a fully nurse-led model that continues to this day in a much scaled back capacity because again, it was COVID funding and the dollars were flowing. Uh, There's about 10,000 people experiencing homelessness in Toronto. Um, so it was, you know, there was a need to really mount a system very, very quickly. Uh, in, in regular times, we would probably, you know, do a pilot, do a proof of concept, but we had to just act very, very quickly. Um, so it was a wonderful experience. I had over 200 nurses um, about 20 nurse practitioners who were just instrumental in providing life-saving care uh, for this patient population. Uh, so that was a great experience over COVID. And uh, it's something that I'm really proud of because the nurses were really part of co-developing the program. Um, and it was, it was just a great experience to be able to pivot on a dime and uh, just kind of show how nurses can uh, show up for people with, uh, who are facing structural vulnerability. Um, so I think you've heard a lot about me, but I, I do always want to say that um, when, the, when the, the notion of being appointed into the role is a bit of a misnomer because it wasn't that I was plucked from the sky and you know landed in this position. It was a competitive process. It was a job that I applied for. I was actually teaching the health policy master's course at U of T at the time and finishing up the work uh, with Inner City Health Associates. And um, the position came up, the posting came up, and one of my master's students actually did um, her paper, her analysis on the green statement of the role, and you know, would it be tokenistic, and was it really going to, you know, have an influential role in policy? And unbeknownst to the student, I was also applying for the job at that time, <laughs> so she did very well on the paper. <laughs> Um, but there's sort of three parts to the role. One is to provide strategic advice. So I sit within, I'm a, in a public servant, not an elected official. Um, I'm within the pub, uh, strategic policy branch of Health Canada, which is a very busy shop. Uh, lots of lots of priority policy uh, work goes on in that area. As you can imagine, there's dental care, there's vaping, there's uh, control drugs and substances, there's home care, long-term care standards, all kinds of things. I've been very laser focused on health workforce challenges, um, but certainly am getting more involved in some of the other files as well. Um, nurses will have a key role to play when the dental plan is rolled out as well. Uh, so that's been one of the, kind of the bread and butter of the position or the, the, the main part of the, of the role. But I think the convening role of the federal government is something that is often underestimated or underappreciated. And um, certainly it was something that I didn't fully appreciate until I came into the role. So as you know, federally in our federated model, we fund health care and it's up to the provinces and territories to determine how health care is going to be delivered. And um, and so the convening role is very important in, in terms of bringing the nursing community together, bringing the stakeholders together, and um, ensuring that we have the right voices at the table influencing decision making. Uh, so that's been something that um, has been really key and, and I think is an important role the federal government plays in terms of leadership in healthcare. Um, and then finally, I represent the government of Canada, both within Canada and internationally, although most of my work has been domestic, as you can imagine, because the role was vacant for so long and uh, also because of our workforce challenges. But we did have a really exciting opportunity in Canada, and I know many of you were, um, some of you were in attendance, uh, where we were the host country of the largest nursing conference in, Canada, in the world. I want to say Canada, in the world. Uh, we uh, were the host country for the International Council of Nurses Congress in July, where we welcomed over 6,000 nurses from 130 countries to Canada. And that meeting was in Montreal. And we had both the federal health minister at the time, Minister Duclos, we had a shuffle just a few weeks after that event, a uh, cabinet shuffle, but uh, we also had the prime minister there as well. So there was lots of selfie time uh, with the prime minister, uh, with all of the nurses. 
I did also attend um, in March of last year, no, March of this year, I attended a, uh, an invitational forum on the regulation of nursing practice in the Americas, and that was in Brazil. So when the World Health Organization divides up the globe, we are in the Americas region from Nunavut to Argentina and the Caribbean, everything in between. And that was really interesting to sort of figure out um, you know, what the best practices are for countries that have regulatory frameworks. Many don't, um, particularly in, cent in cent Central and South America. Um, and so really kind of talking about um, our best practices in Canada, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that um, I think BC is really an exemplar in terms of being a single regulator for all categories of nurse, uh, of all categories of nurses, and then also for mid midwives. Um, so that's, I think, really um, powerful when we think of the work of regulation being very similar across the health professions and having an amalgamated structure is uh, much more efficient um, than other jurisdictions. So this is really what I've been up to since I started. So part of my role is to co-chair the Principal Nursing Advisors Task Force, so that's comprised of all of the provincial and territorial government chief nursing officers or a delegate. Not every jurisdiction has a government chief nursing officer. Most do. Um, but it also includes the federal nurse executive. So that's Indigenous Services Canada, Veterans Affairs Canada, um, the Canadian Armed Forces has both a civilian and a military workforce, uh, including many nurses. Uh, the, correction, the federal jails, sorry, federal prisons, Correctional Services Canada, ESDC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and so on. Um, and so I have, they sit at the Principal Nursing Advisors Task Force, which is a really important committee uh, reporting up to the Conference of Deputy Ministers. So it's part of the Committee on Health Workforce, which is one of these FPT committees, Federal, Provincial, Territorial Committees. And um, we meet monthly to talk about um, nursing regulation, nursing policy, all kinds of things like nurse prescribing, um, Trying to think of some of the midwifery services. Um, we have all kinds of new topics every month. Um, we look at collective bargaining agreements across the country, competitive compensation, all sorts of things. Um, and then I separately have also co uh, convened the um, federal nurse executives, and that's been a really great opportunity to look at what are the nursing workforce, what do the nursing workforces like look like within our respective um, government departments. Um, and so interestingly, uh, you know, part of the challenge of coming into a role that was vacant for over a decade was just setting up internal structure as well uh, within government. And I'm really pleased to say that I have an entirely uh, nurse-led team uh, comprised of four nurses. Uh, we're part of the Health Human Resource Task Force, but we're all nurses. But we're not categorized as nurses because we're not in CHIN or community health nurse positions, which is kind of the federal designation of uh, nursing designation, so we're in policy type roles, um, but uh, definitely all nurses uh, on my team. Um, I also have really prioritized engagement across every province and territory. So when I started, I said I'm an RN from Ontario, I need to hit the ground running, and to be effective in my role, I need to understand nursing from coast to coast to coast. And um, internally, they, were, they sort of said, yes, you can, you can do that. Um, do your tour, you know, visit every jurisdiction, and then, you know, that'll be it. Um, and so I was actually here uh, last, I think last October for the health minister's meeting, did some engagement, was up in Prince George, went over to Victoria. Um, and I, by August of this year, I had almost completed the tour with the exception of the Northwest Territories, which for obvious reasons was cancelled. That was, it was cancelled in August. Uh, but I've been everywhere else. I am going to the Northwest Territories in January. Um, and, uh, but I think there's now, you know, a year, 15 months into the role, there's recognition that ongoing engagement is a regular part of my role. And it's really essential because our geography is so massive in Canada. And it's really, you know, it's important not to just visit urban centers. It's important to get to rural and remote areas as well. 
Um, but, you know, really, really important for me to understand the practice variability across the country and all of the varied things that nurses do. Uh, so the engagement is really recognized now as an ongoing part of my role. So I'm actually here in Vancouver for the um, Children's Healthcare Canada Conference, uh, which starts tomorrow, uh, but of course doing engagement like this um, as part of my visit. And then I prioritize retention. So when I was appointed into the role, uh, there were lots of calls from the nursing community to convene nurses, bring nurses together, hold a forum. And of course, we were doing some work uh, federally in terms of convening interprofessional uh, groups. They, we have a coalition for action on health workers. Um, and there was some, there, it took some time to socialize the concept that a, an initiative for nurses uh, uniquely for nurses was needed, a unique professional initiative. Um, and But I would say by the fall of last year, um, they, they kind of said, okay, Lee, you can do your thing. <laughs> you can have your forum. Um, and, uh, and, and then there was you know, a lot of uh, pressure to actually deliver and have a forum. So uh, it was very clear to me that there was lots of work being done at the provincial level on recruitment and much less on retention. Um, and that probably understandable, you know, governments don't want to close emergency departments, health authorities don't want to close emergency departments, nor do, um, uh, nor do health authorities. And, um, you know, and that's, uh, that focus on retent or recruitment is, is probably very understandable. But we know that unless we actually change the working conditions of nurses, there'll be an endless flow of nurses either out of the public sector or out of the profession. So really trying, trying to shift the focus to looking at retention with a very broad definition of retention to include the return of nurses who may have sought early retirement or who may have left the profession uh, altogether or who may have left for private agency travel nursing. Um, so we held, I, I convened an advisory group um, a superstar advisory group and they helped to inform the development of the nursing retention forum and so we held this large pan-canadian nursing retention forum in june uh, and i'm going to tell you a bit more about that in the slides that come yes yeah. so when we had the nursing retention forum we didn't we did things differently. I think that's the benefit of being a newcomer to government. I'm not a professional bureaucrat, so I think the typical government format would be to have a fully cooked toolkit and say, now come and everybody bless it. Uh, and I really wanted us to co-develop the toolkit. I really felt that nurses needed to be, this needed to be participatory and we couldn't develop the toolkit without the feedback and without the input from nurses from across the country. And so that was really the intent of the, the Nursing Retention Forum. Uh, we had sort of some ideas of how, what we wanted to do. We had these themes developed with help from the advisory committee, but the intent of the day of on the, on the forum day was really for everyone to uh, roll up their sleeves and get involved in, uh, in developing the toolkit. Um, so we really think that the toolkit, it's, it's still in production. We uh, released the executive summary, which is what you're seeing here, um, just about six weeks ago um, for the health, Federal Provincial Territorial Health Minister's meeting on Prince Edward Island. And, um, and so that has been released, but the full toolkit itself is under development. And the, so the executive summary is on the Canada.ca website now in both official languages. But the, the, um, we hope that the toolkit really gives a lexicon to the moral distress that nurses have experienced and offers ways that we can actually improve the working lives of nurses in Canada. So you can see it's focused on these eight themes, but then there's the themes are under, underpinned by these essential core values. And the values are respect, anti-racism, anti-oppression, transparency, and accountability. And they really kind of encircle the themes. So um, we, we hope that these are, this is a valuable tool for employers and health authorities to use. Um, what was very exciting at the health minister's meeting um, about six weeks ago was that the health ministers agreed to support the implementation and dissemination of the toolkit. And that was in writing, in the joint communique, also on the Canada.ca website. So I think that, you know, one of the questions I often get asked is, where's the money to implement this? And I mean, I sometimes 
in my inside voice think there's lots of money to be spent on agency nurses, lots of money on recruitment, the endless cycle of recruitment. But we have also seen a record investment in healthcare this year of over $200 billion in February, with BC being the first jurisdiction to sign a bi bilateral agreement for the federal funding transfer. So there is money. There's in fact a record investment in healthcare in Canada, and now we have dedication from the, from the provincial um, and territorial ministers to implement this toolkit. So I think that's really promising that there is uh, recognition that we need to do things differently in healthcare um, and we need to value nurses differently. So you can see here the first four themes. Um, and all of these are structured fairly similarly. So you'll see the theme at the top, you'll see the goal statement, and then you'll see three initiatives under each. And all of these um, toolkit themes have three initiatives except for the last one. Um, and I would say that, you know, some of the things that are getting a lot of attention, um, you know, some organizations are already using the executive summary to do their strategic planning, to develop a nursing strategy, even as a benchmarking exercise to see how they're doing, how they're faring. Um, so some of the things that are getting a lot of attention are scheduling systems. So, uh, you know, a lot of organizations are still using <laughs> paper and pen um, scheduling. So really looking at automating and modernizing scheduling systems. Um, another thing that's getting um, a lot of attention, I'm, I'm kind of picking on the second theme, flexible and balanced ways of working, is flexible work design. So I think this is definitely a challenge in uh, our 24-7 healthcare, some of our healthcare facilities, which are 24-7, but I think COVID has forced this reimagination of how we actually work and how we balance work and life. And I think that, you know, the healthcare sector is also going to have to reimagine how we how we balance work and life because workers want different things now. And if we don't have the workforce, we can't sustain the care. Um, Another thing I think is zero tolerance for violence, bullying, and racism. So one of the things that we did, uh, the federal government did um, during COVID was uh, made, they made changes to the cr criminal code um, uh, around Bill C-3. And this was really around the protests that were happening outside of health facilities that what they were, they, they were, the protests were impeding uh, healthcare providers from actually entering healthcare facilities. And so that legislation was passed, and what I've found in my engagement across the country is that no one knows about it. Uh, it's not enforced, it doesn't transcend from outside the building to inside in terms of what's happening inside. You know, nurses have described getting choked with lanyards, uh, the abuse from patients and families, and there's no enforcement, whether it's by security or municipal enforcement or even awareness. Um, so really looking at, you know, that how we can actually increase the awareness of Bill C-3 and perhaps have other strategies for um, zero tolerance for bullying, harassment, and racism. This is something students talk about a lot, and I, I think this is contributing to the attrition that we're seeing in nursing education programs. You know, nurses, nursing students get into the clinical environment and uh, are facing this um, toxic toxicity of, of some of our practice environments and our sort of piecing out of our education programs. Um, and so in the next um, in the next four themes here, um, I would say reduced administrative burden is something that's also getting a lot of attention. The CMA, and this is their big advocacy push this year, um, and I think what's interesting is their, the medical, um, our medical colleagues, their perspective of, of administrative burden is very different from what nurses um, say around administrative burden. Their focus is really on um, forms, federal forms especially, um, and things that a you know, physician extender like a, a physician assistant could do. Um, but what nurses want are, are, are really different things. Nurses are kind of the gap fillers in the system, and I think what, what, is, what nurses have described, you know, ensuring the documentation requirements aren't uh, superfluous to what, you know, regulatory requirements are, and, and sometimes organizations have extra requirements. Um, ensuring that there are digital tools and digital transformation supports to really automate some of the work that we're doing and then work redesign. And I think this is where, you know, nurses are getting the pillows and the, 
the ice and just you know taking the meal trays and and um, and also doing um, you know bed baths and personal care and I think you know I certainly was one of those nurses who said we have to keep doing those things because that's how we assess skin integrity that's how we establish a therapeutic relationship but we also need to be hanging chemo and blood products and so we can't do it all we have to be willing to give some things up and this requires you know close collaboration but re really looking at how we can redesign work and model, looking at models of care. So the only theme that has two initiatives under it is safe staffing. And um, one of the things, I would say the number one thing that's getting the most attention is safe staffing frameworks. And PC um, really, I think, told the rest of the country that they were on to retention when they, um, you know, in collaboration with the BCNU and the BC government announced the implementation or announced I know it's not been implemented yet, but announced safe staffing frameworks and tools. So this is just a similar um, initiative has just been adopted by the Nova Scotia Nurses Union. It's not called safe staffing, it's called like a guaranteed minimum staffing or something different, but same, um, same premise. I know Quebec is very interested in this as well, and I wouldn't be surprised if other jurisdictions follow suit. Uh, recognizing that it's just one piece of nursing retention, but it has great symbolic value, I think, for nurses to say, you know, we can't have an endless amount of patients. We can't safely provide care uh, when we're constantly being asked to do more. And interestingly, this is something that Magnet does, designated facilities, Magnet hospitals, um, have implemented really robust uh, staffing ratios, and it's had a, a really great impact on uh, retention. So the retention toolkit, um, have a look on the Canada.ca website. We are releasing it early 2024. And I really believe that our collective, it's been a ton of work to get to this point. It's now going through translation and production and all of those things. Uh, uh, but I think our collective work really begins when the toolkit is out, when it's published or produced, um, because we really need to ensure that it gets implemented. So some of these priorities I think I've talked about already, uh, but these are also priorities that were highlighted um, after the federal, provincial, territorial health ministers meeting. And they're things that I was certainly given an agenda for action when I started in the role and things that I've continued to build on um, in my 15 months in the role. So nursing retention, of course, is critical. Um, nursing education and training, so really looking at how we're preparing nurses for practice. We funded um, the Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing Residency Program to help with that, those preceptorship opportunities, that transition to practice. But it's safe to say that we, are, we do not have enough uh, nursing education seats. Um, and I think that the challenge is that it's very, uh, it's political hot potato to say, or hot button to say, you know, let's increase the seats by 200 in, in, jurist in one jurisdiction without actually saying, do we have faculty? Do we have placement opportunities? Do we have sim spaces? Do we have physical resources? And how can we actually ensure the quality of nursing education? So we need to increase the supply. Um, we need our domestic supply of nurses. Uh, we need to have more seats, but we need to do so while also ensuring quality. But it's interesting, it's a bit of a maldistribution problem as well because we have about four to eight applicants for every nursing education seat in the southern provinces and a completely inadequate supply in the north and rural and remote. So we need to look at this. And, and this is challenging because post-secondary is entirely provincially or territorially funded. Um, but no longer are we producing, if we're educating in British Columbia, no longer are we educating for nurses to remain in British Columbia. We have a hypermobile workforce, not just in nursing, but in all sectors. And so we need to think about that when we're preparing our graduates for practice. Internationally educated nurses, this is of course another one of those political hot potatoes. Um, and uh, I think you know our focus federally is really on internationally educated nurses who are choosing to come and work and live in Canada and really trying to accelerate the pathway for their integration because it's cumbersome, it's lengthy, it's expensive. And I think we've seen significant progress in this area over the last year. Um, the challenge remains that many, all the jurisdictions across the country, and this is really a provincial phenomenon, the territories don't have a mechanism for a licensure of internationally educated nurses. They require the, they require the provinces 
um, to register them initially, and then they register by endorsement. Um, so we've seen great advancements in this area, but the challenge remains that the requirements are all different in every jurisdiction. It actually creates a lot of interjurisdictional competition. Some jurisdictions have entirely approved countries, some go with NMAS, some don't. Um, it's a bit of a dog's breakfast across the country. And you know, when nurses internationally, these are our colleagues from around the world, when they're choosing Canada, they're choosing Canada. They're not choosing um, British Columbia, no offense to British Columbia. They're probably, they would choose if they knew how beautiful it was. If they knew that your license plate said beautiful British Columbia, they would choose British Columbia. But they're choosing Canada. And so we need to really look at the regulatory regimes across the country um, and really try to accelerate their integration. Uh, labor mobility, I, I've sort of talked about this, I've given you some teasers, but this is definitely a federal priority. It even came out in the fall economic statement. Um, you know, we have not, th this is interesting because I worked at the provincial regulatory body but at the beginning of my career when I was doing my master's and working clinically, nurses, you know, we juggle many jobs at the same time, and I was working on the entry to practice requirements at the time, and this is when most jurisdictions were changing from a community college, to, or changing to a community college diploma uh, for practical nurses, changing to a baccalaureate, um, for registered nurses and changing to a master's for NP in most jurisdictions. I, and I say that because Quebec still has different levels of entry into the profession. Um, but we were really looking at trying to enact you know, free trade labor mobility requirements for portability of licensure then, and it's still not um, been actioned uh, in 2023. And this is something that nurses want. They want that mobility, um, just like physicians have, you know, to go do a locum, uh, to practice in other jurisdictions. Um, and also virtual care has really showed up, shown us that, you know, care transcends borders. And the most salient example is in the evacuation of the capital city in August, where overnight nurses evacuating with those patients on charters needed immediate licensure in BC or Alberta. So even a 24-hour delay is, is, is not good enough for continuity of care. Um, so we really need to advance this work. And I think part of the challenge is the number of nurse regulators we have in Canada. BC is an exemplar. It's BC, Ontario, and Nova Scotia are the only jurisdictions with a single regulator for all categories of nurse. Most other jurisdictions have multiple regulators. Uh, for nursing. Um, and then nursing workforce data and planning. So at the health minister's meeting last October, um, yeah, if you'll recall, it was a big sensationalist uh, political frenzy. Uh, I don't know what else to call it. Um, but the, the health ministers walked away. They were instructed by their premiers to walk away. You know, don't accept any strings attached to federal funding. Uh, finally, those uh, agreements were reached in principle in February, and that's when the federal funding announcement was made. But the accountability is for data. We don't have good workforce planning data in Canada. So when I say that we have 466,000 nurses in Canada, if they're licensed in more than one jurisdiction, we're counting them twice. And so there's really no integrity of the data. We aren't able to do supply and demand forecasting. You know, we, I think some jurisdictions use nurse per capita. Ontario really uses that a lot, um, but it's really tricky. It's an OECD metric. Uh, so, you know, it does, it would track in Canada because we're a rich nation, but it doesn't track in our geography. If we do nurse per capita, when you've got 40,000 people in the Yukon, it doesn't work. Um, and so we really need better forecasting um, for health human resources. And so the data has been a major preoccupation of this government and uh, really trying to get better, not just the chi hi data that is submitted, but better proactive data uh, so that we can actually do some of that, um, some of those projections. And uh, so that's been a major focus. One of the things we funded federally was the Nurses NURSYS in Canada project, which is actually a tool from the National Council of State Boards of Nursing in the US, but other, other countries internationally have also adopted it, and it applies a unique identifier to nurses. So we can better track where they're working. Uh, we're not double counting. We can also track their mobility across the country. And it'll help with data. So those are all um, certainly priorities that you'll see in the um, echoed in the federal, provincial, territorial health ministers' um, priorities as well. 
And I think I always sort of end with values and talk about values because I think this is something that um, it's really important for us as leaders to talk about the values, make the implicit explicit. So I really do talk about uh, unity in the nursing profession and NPBC is a wonderful example of unity in bringing all of the uh, different categories of nurse to bear in one professional association that is quite unique. Um, and I think that, you know, that notion of unity is not echoed across the country when I talk about um, nursing in some jurisdictions. Um, I get feedback like, or do you mean the RPN profession or the LPN profession? And I think, well, no, this is the nursing profession and we're all one profession. Um, and, and so I think that that really has contributed to the way that we have been devalued. Um, the way that nursing work has been invisibilized in many ways, um, but really promoting unity, I think, is really key. Seeing ourselves, seeing the strength in, you know, almost half a million nurses in Canada, that's incredibly powerful. Um, equity, diversity, inclusion, of course, should be centered in all of the work that we're doing, and I think I'm very mindful of, you know, being a white, cisgendered, middle class, Chief Nursing Officer of Canada, and so part of my responsibility is working with groups like the Canadian Black Nurses Alliance, uh, the Pan-Canadian Nurses of African Descent, the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association, and so on, really trying to center their work, and that was really, really important in the Nursing Retention Forum and in the Advisory Committee. So uni professional, I've already kind of talked about this, but I, of course we all work and live in the interprofessional milieu, that is the sandbox we all play in, uh, but I do think it's really important to highlight the unique contribution of nurses to care and uh, to really center nurses. We are the most proximal to care and we're the largest group of regulated health professionals and so it's really important for us to also think from a uni professional perspective as well. And then attunement to social determinants of health. This is, I mean, we all know this. Uh, even if we're, you know, working in acute care, we know that, you know, this even as a theoretical construct. But I do think that we need to really think about how we can transform the system with a reorientation to addressing social determinants of health. And this is something nurses know and live and breathe. Um, but we, it, you know, Minister Holland said recently, uh, so he, Minister Holland is our new federal health minister. Um, he's about five months in the job, I think. And he said, we have to drive the bus while changing the tires. So this notion of, you know, we have to keep health systems afloat, but we also have to transform the system. If we keep focusing on the no bed admit, admits in emergency departments, the emergency department closures, the overcapacity issues, uh, we'll never have enough acute care beds. We still have at least a quarter or more of people in Canada unattached to primary care, and we really need to look upstream. We really need to think about who, who doesn't have access to primary care, where could these uh, resources exist in community-based care, which is far less expensive, and far less resource intensive than acute care. We're always gonna need acute care. Um, but we also need to look at, you know, who is getting sick, who is staying sick, who are the folks who have unmet needs um, and that are, uh, you know, costing our healthcare system a lot. And it's not about cost, it's really about unmet needs. Um, I do think that we always make really good decisions when we center the patient and provider perspective. So this probably sounds um, a bit counterintuitive when I say, you know, we need to get get out of the politics of healthcare, the economics. Those things can, you know, you go to healthcare facilities and you can see what's what's fo what's foregrounded. Often it's flow, it's efficiency, it's wait times. Those are the things that get foregrounded. But we all always <coughs> need to think about what's best for the patient and what's best for the provider. And that was really my North Star in COVID with all the novelty, you know, patient population was new, caring for people in hotels was new, um, and COVID was new for all of us. But we made we made good decisions if we were talking, if we were focusing on what was best for the patient and what was best for the provider. And of course we need to reduce some of the bureaucratic barriers because they're really creating a lot of inefficiencies in the system. So where I've seen some real promises um, you know, jurisdictions that are collaborating across borders and, and really looking at, you know, how care can be seamlessly provided. I know that, you know, that often happens for um, patients from NWT coming down to um, BC and so on. Um, it certainly occurs in the Atlantic region. 
and that there's other innovations that are popping up across the country, which I think is really promising, because care transcends borders. You know, I didn't get health insurance when I came here. I just bring my Ontario health card and hope for the best. Um, <laughs> hope I don't have to utilize your health care system <laughs> with great respect for the care that's provided. <laughs> Um, and then harm reduction, you know, that has been my lens. I've worked in this area since about 2017. And actually in 2017, I was out here um, as an harm reduction advocate uh, for a meeting organized by the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition on scaling up supervised consumption sites. And a colleague died in his hotel room and did not make it to the conference. So I've been to nursing conferences, you know, for since I graduated um, from my nursing, uh, in, when I started nursing, and you know, I got involved in policy and doing all kinds of other things as well as being a critical care nurse, and uh, I've never experienced anything like that, like saving a seat beside me for a colleague who's <coughs> texting him saying, you know, are you coming? It's like a day and a half meeting. Where are you? And uh, he was he was dead in his hotel room. So the overdose crisis is, I know, you know, of course you know this. Uh, but it still is killing 21 people per day, every day in Canada. It's entirely preventable. And so there's a lot more that can be done. And I think this, this lens of harm reduction is something that we can instill in every aspect of practice. You know, people who use drugs need hip replacements. They have babies. Uh, it's not just in harm reduction services. And that is the end. So I think it's really clear that the reinstatement has come at a critical time, but it's a critical time for all of us. And it really is an opportunity for us to reimagine uh, a different future for nursing in Canada. And so with that, I will sit down and I think welcome the panel. But thank you very much for having me. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Wignall. I am the Director of Professional Practice and Health Policy with the Nurses and Nurse Practitioners of British Columbia. And I'm a registered nurse living on unceded Lekwungen territory, the homes of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. Um, I'm here today to support the facilitation of a panel. And so I'd like to invite our four panelists up to the stage. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome a group of four nurses to the stage. Um, NNPBC chose to seize this opportunity with Dr. Chapman to uh, facilitate a little bit more of a structured dialogue this afternoon. And we held a public facing application process for nurses who are interested in raising issues and solutions um, that might be appropriate for a federal level conversation. And through that public facing process, we received an enormous number of applicants, some incredibly interesting and diverse nurses from all across British Columbia. And these wonderful four nurses um, were selected to represent the voice of nurses here today in this conversation. Um, and in British Columbia, we have over 60,000 nurses. Um, so these uh, four wonderful humans are, are holding that space for us today. The panel will proceed um, with one by one, each sharing the issue that is close to their heart, and then everyone having an opportunity to engage in conversation about that issue, and I will support as needed. Um, but I'll start off by introducing our panelist nurses. So I'd like to welcome Vanender Baines. Vanender is a clinical nurse specialist in critical care at a tertiary acute care hospital for the past seven years and is an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia School of Nursing. Her 26-year nursing career includes 17 years as an ICU nurse at the Vancouver Hospital and the past seven years as a clinical nurse specialist with Providence Healthcare. Vinny is also a clinical instructor at BCIT's Critical Care Nursing Specialty Program, and she holds a Master of Science in Nursing focused on clinical research from UBC, and you are a certified nurse in critical care. <laughs> Welcome, Vinny. Tess Croker is a registered psychiatric nurse and has been in practice for nearly 30 years. Tess is a direct care nurse of her first 15 years of his career, and in the past 15 years, Tess has worked in nursing regulation and post-secondary, and he currently serves as the director of nursing for Douglas College. 
Tess holds a diploma in psychiatric nursing, an advanced diploma in psychiatric nursing, a bachelor's of health sciences degree, a master's of business administration, and is currently a doctoral candidate in the social service sciences program at Royal Roads University, where his research focuses on substance use stigma. Welcome, Tess. Lisa, who's a lovely dear to my heart, <laughs> Lisa McLeod is trained and worked for the first part of her career in the United Kingdom, where she worked in pediatrics, public health, and PICU. After returning to BC, she went on to complete BCID specialty nursing in both emergency and critical care, and is the trauma coordinator role and served in the trauma coordinator role um, for Centre and North Vancouver Island, as well as clinical operations management at Nanaimo in both patient access and flow and very challenging emergency department, which is where I think we first met. Lisa then returned to bedside nursing in the emergency department at Vancouver General Hospital during the COVID-19 pandemic and came full circle in 2022, completing the BCIT specialty pediatric critical care training after 30 plus years in nursing. And it's last but certainly not least, <laughs> is Carmen Siglow. Carmen is a registered nurse who lives and works in Vernon, BC in the interior region of the province. And Carmen has had a variety of experiences in acute care focusing on critical care and specialty areas until obtaining her Master of Science in Nursing in 2011, at which point she accepted a position as Staff Development Educator for the Vernon Jubilee Hospital. In addition to working in the hospital, Carmen is also the nurse clinician with a certified practice for options for sexual health clinic in the community and is a clinical tutor in the UBC Southern Medical Program in Kelowna. Please take a moment to welcome this incredible panel of nurses. So Vinny, this is your moment to step forward into this space with an issue close to your heart, so I'll turn the floor to you. Okay, so Angela told us to... She told us to take everything we wrote down the form and, and synthesize it down to one issue, and I, I tried. I tried. <laughs> um, but in my mind, um, there's a Venn diagram, and there's three overlapping circles. And those circles, I, I could not figure out how to unlink them, and I'm going to explain to you why. Um, the first one is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. The second one is systemic racism. And the third is climate change. Um, so back in 2020, when you know we were just trying to get ready for this pandemic and terrified in critical care of what we were going to see, um, we asked the whole world to stop, to, to slow down, to stay at home uh, while we did stuff. And, and amazingly, the entire world did. Um, and it was, um, it, we had got a glimpse of what we potentially could have if we addressed climate change the way we were addressing COVID-19. Like the, the air was clearer, the roads were quiet, and, and, and wildlife reclaimed spaces that we had usurped. Um, and so that was a, a, a glimpse of what we could have. Um, simultaneously, humanity was also having some really real, uh, difficult, um, and, and, and thoughtful conversations about systemic racism. Um, and for me, um, it, it really started with the Black Lives Movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. It, it really crystallized with the inquiry into Joyce Eshel Kwan's death, um, because that hit really close to home. Those were critical care nurses like me. Um, and it, it didn't stop there. It played over and over and over again throughout this pandemic. We, um, uh, we saw how scarcity exacerbated inequities in our society. So, and, and sometimes it was personal, like sometimes it hit home a little bit too close to home. Um, and so what we learned is um, that, that those, those impacts of systemic racism didn't just affect patients and families, they also impacted nurses. Like if you looked at who in our healthcare system was historically understaffed and historically under-resourced and didn't have access to PPE, the thing that we really wanted to in the very beginning, um, those uh, areas were often staffed with racialized and immigrant staff. So they were the ones that we put the greatest burden on. Um, so that was hard to see. Um, and then 2021 happened. Um, where we had every climate disaster all at once in one year, including a tornado, which I don't think anyone noticed. Um, and while we were rushing to adapt to multiple climate emergencies, 
um, the way we were rushing to adapt with, to COVID. Um, our healthcare system was never designed, never designed to cope with this, and yet we tried to figure out how to do so. And when I looked at those different climate emergencies and who it would impact and how how it would work, how would we deal with it? Um, it, it was uh, it was hard to figure out what the answers to those questions were, but I knew that what we were seeing with racism was going to play out in this, this emergency as well. Um, and as we rushed to, to adapt to these different emergencies, um, what we found was, um, uh, sorry, is, is our healthcare system actually is a huge contributor to the problem. Like you've got to see, like take a look at how much energy we consume. Take a look at our global supply chains that feed us all the supplies that we used to think were always going to be there. Um, and then you see, oh my God, this is crazy. Like the, the streets are littered with our used masks. While we consume forests to make more, we have a deference for disposable things in healthcare, like a real deference. We, and we, we, we often never even consider reusable or recyclable items in, in that process. So that's my question is how, as we try to work in the system and maintain and, and, and transform the system, how do we do it in a way where we're not the problem for these two really, really big problems? That is a great question, and so I invite the panel. Um, what are your thoughts on this Venn diagram of anti-racism, climate change, and, and sustainment of the healthcare system? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> It's been a long time since nursing's had a voice like you. And there's a Nelson Mandela of nursing into you. And uh, I really, I'm so encouraged. I am. I've, I've been a nurse for longer than you've been alive, probably. <laughs> and, um, and I've yet to hear someone speak so articulately about the problems of the world. So you spoke about homelessness and how that population was marginalized during COVID and what, how we rallied to help them. And with that is a generation of nurses that are looking in their curriculum at racism, at sustainability, and as individuals are looking for a better planet. And they are taking initiatives in areas where they work and live, and they want to bring that home. And they will be raising children. So therefore, um, I think it's great that you raise them. I'm so admiring you. It's the best day I've ever had. I've met all these wonderful people. And um, I think that, that you have, a, you have a, a way to deal with that in the fact that you know, just the three circles that um, Vinny described, I think you're going to address them in some way. <laughs> hey, Nelson Mandela, let's go. <laughs> wow. I'm not often speechless, but I'm very moved. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think this is our collective work, right? And I think that in many ways, I love, I will never get those. When you started thinking with the Venn diagrams, I was like, how does she link these three? And then it, it clicked, you know? And I think COVID was an unveiling in many ways. And, you know, I, when I've spoken to the chief nurse in the NHS in, in the UK, they have a single healthcare system. Right, so when in the wake of George, George Floyd's death, they just implemented anti-racism policy throughout the whole of the NHS. Standards, practice standards, zero uh, tolerance for violence and bullying, and anti-black racism, um, and anti-oppressive practices. I mean, I'm just probably imperfect, you know, as any big rollout is, but at least it was something. And I think that we, I think the challenge and the opportunity is in our patchwork across the Right, ensuring that finding, I think what the toolkit does is it says, here's an organization, when the full toolkit is out, I just gave you the teaser, right? But when the full toolkit is out, it actually has resources and exemplars. So we have organizations that are implementing zero tolerance for racism and bullying. And, you know, and we're highlighting those, those organizations because the perennial challenge, as I said, is money, you know. If, if, so when the toolkit is released, if organizations open this toolkit and say, where do I start? How do I implement this? But if they can see that a neighboring facility or a facility you know, elsewhere in Canada is doing this thing, it, it maybe isn't so far-fetched. 
And I think that that also goes for, you know, there's lots of greening initiatives that have been underway in greening healthcare. There's a lot of organizations that have been, been uh, lobbying pretty hard for um, like net zero procurement in healthcare. Um, but again, you know, it really is up to the jurisdictions. And we, we have to respect that. Like that is in the constitution. We can't override the jurisdiction and say thou shalt, you know, do this, do X, Y, and Z. I think that's the benefit of our federated model is the opportunity, but it also is a challenge. Yeah. I was just thinking of when we were running out of PPE, and I'm like, why are we relying on disposable PPE? Yeah. Like, how, that, that's, like, it was so hard. And then there's so many items that we rely on disposable things. Like, why are, we, why are we relying on And the other thing that I think George Floyd, the Black Lives um, Matter movement, is looking at racism not as an interaction between two people, but looking at racism in a systemic way. There is, there, and that's what makes systemic racism so invisible. And that's why the experiences of, of indigenous and black and people of color is often invisible because you don't live in the skin and you don't see the system if you're not. So, so just making it visible and making and recognizing it's not just the interaction between two people. It is the system that ha is the system that led us to a place where long-term care facilities have primary racialized staff and ended up with you know under-resourced uh, uh, um, in so many ways. And picking up on, I think, that thread of oppression and stigmatization, I know, Tess, you wanted to bring forward um, pieces around your issues around mental health and substance use as well. So the floor is yours. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to make a comment. I, I love how your mind has put together all of these elements. <clears throat> and I just wanted to highlight an example. Um, it, it's almost as if so like the really pragmatic policy. So at Douglas College, we have an anti-racism and bullying harassment policy. So you know, we can refer to it and, and provide some guidelines. But it misses the element of culture. So how do we begin to start changing the culture and the ideology? And one of the questions that I posed um, was that we have um, reserve seats for self-declared Indigenous students. However, you know, it could be viewed as a, as a structural stigma because there are vulnerabilities with students identify. They may not necessarily want to identify. And so even though it seems like a really positive gesture, it's actually a significant barrier. And so the question that I ask individuals is how do we, you know, continue to provide an opportunity to actually encourage students to declare um, you know, with the um, potential backlash of them receiving and being a direct sort of target of stigma and uh, racism and discrimination. So, you know, it, it's a matter of how, how, does, how does the policy and the initiatives translate to, you know, the, the, the subtle transitions of culture in our, in our nursing and educational communities. So, would you like me to go into my notes? Sorry. Um, so, so what I would like to talk about is, uh, you know, from the retention perspective, is the, the matter of mental health and wellness in the context of emotional labor for students, faculty, um, but also you know just navigating the healthcare process, the healthcare system. So, you know, begin to look really deeply at this issue when. I started to hear some of the statistics of nursing students leaving or like new grads, leaving the profession. Um, so we're upwards of 33% within the first three years. Um, that was starting to happen before the pandemic um, and now is actually worse. Um, I think that we really are in a critical situation. We, um, you know, Douglas College, like a lot of the other schools in BC were you know, we had at one point a thousand students on our wait list, and now we have, um, you know, about 66% less applicants for the nursing program, and that's Douglas. Um, that is also, you know, it's across the board. So every nursing leader that I talk to in post secondary is saying the same things. A lot of them cannot even fill a cohort uh, for intake. 
So we are in a significant crisis. So, you know, we're starting to look at uh, what's happening with our students. So what we started to do in Douglas is to build in mental health, wellness, and resilience during for our students um, to not only navigate the realities of healthcare, so we're seeing all of these complex patient issues, uh, challenging uh, workplace environments, on one side of it, so, um, and I'm, I'm still a direct care nurse, I work with the Federal Correctional Service in Canada, um, and my colleagues are damaged. You know, we experience a significant amount of, of abuse and, uh, you know, from, from patients, but also from colleagues. Uh, so that's one side of it, just the realities of the profession, but the other side of it is the, um, the direct bullying that nurses are you know, doing to our students and to our new grads. Um, as a director, you know, inevitably every semester, faculty will forward a student journal saying, I, I can't believe the way I was treated on the unit, and, and I don't know if I can work in this profession. So, you know, my, I guess, vision, and I was so happy to see it in the toolkit, is just around um, you know, the, the mental health and wellness focus. Um, it's it's a stigma, you know. It's mental health, so it's hard to to address those issues, to support nurses to to identify those issues, to start talking about it, feeling comfortable in an environment that embraces that. Um, so we want to build the res you know the resiliency with our students, um, but we also want to develop a model where the students are coming out strong, so that they can actually emulate that in the clinical environment. So a vision would be, you know, signing signing a charter around mental health and safety. It would be um, providing education, training, workshops, and a real investment because I think that single-handedly is one of uh, the most devastating issues around our, our retention for nursing. So thank you for indulging me in this conversation. And it's such an and so I invite the panel thoughts around uh, this vision for a charter, because of, um, as you put it, Tess, and this challenge of students. Lisa? Yeah, I would comment that I, I think a charter is a fantastic idea. I think that culture is such a broad and difficult um, area to, to try to change, um, and it can be so unique to every working environment. But I also think that we have, um, you know, psychological standards for, um, you know, safe psych psychological workplaces um, that each health authority has um, subscribed to, and so um, I think most of our health authorities have um, assessment tools and, and ways to actually assess our working environments. Um, I think. What I worry about is that because of the pace and the, the pressures that most environments or whatever your, your work environment is, we're all so stretched that these valuable tools are not given the weight and the opportunity to be used. Um, but I think these are, these are important things to do and to be able to discuss with your team. And I think there's not a team out there that doesn't want to be you know, robust in their numbers so that they can give the best care. Um, and I think there is an ownership for each of us within our teams to, to welcome new members of our team and, and really make them feel um, valued within our team so that they're going to want to stay. Because I like exactly what you described, every team I've worked in, whether it's Emerge, Critical Care, Public Health, whatever, we, there's, there's been some of this dysfunction within teams which has, has left new, new members feeling like, oh, that's not a team for me and I'm going elsewhere. And that's that's tragic, actually, and so um, and more tragic when when nurses are actually leaving the profession altogether. And so I think there's a lot of work we can all do. Um, and I think um, it, it is that tension between the delivering the care that we do within our teams or institutions if you're if you're teaching, um, but also taking care of your team. So I think it it, it really takes a lot of um, weight and attention. So. I think you've included a lot of that within your with your retention kit, so I'm excited to see that too. I 
I'm also um, thoughtful around uh, the thread between what you've shared, Vinny, and what you've shared, Tess. There's so much inter interweaving between those experiences because we know that folks who are racialized, folks um, from equity deserving groups experience those kinds of aspects of violence more significantly than, for example, someone like myself as a white settler nurse. So that interplay between those intersecting oppressions and stigmatizations is very real indeed. Lisa, I know that you've brought um, something that shifts us into a little bit of a different aspect of the nursing conversation. Um, joy, I believe, is on the agenda for you. Joy. I didn't make notes because I don't want to forget what I want to say. <laughs> Um, so we all know that there are many challenges uh, facing healthcare today, um, and how often uh, at work do we comment on any number of deficiencies and problems that we face daily? Um, but that doesn't get us closer to the solutions. Um, yet despite these challenges, everywhere we look, nurses are providing excellent care. They are adapting, they are innovating, they are leading change in response to the needs of patients. So how can we spread this excellence and amplify the good? How can organizations balance strategic priorities with valuing nurses' contributions to improve care experiences? We need to create deliberate organizational efforts throughout the system to support nurses working to scope and to showcase nurse-led innovation. Imagine having your improvement idea applauded rather than being told, no, we can't change that process. Imagine feeling joy at work. The Institute for Health Improvement Framework for Joy and in, in Work sorry, uh, describes joy and work as connection to meaning and purpose. And I believe this is a strategy to mitigate against apathy and attrition in our profession. When we can focus on what's meaningful in our work as nurses, and we are given the opportunity to truly engage in that work, to connect and to serve the, to, with those we serve, and, and when we are supported to lead efforts to improve the system we work within, we will experience joy in work. And if we use an appreciative inquiry approach as we discover nursing excellence across the systemic care continuum throughout BC, we can amplify and spread these contributions within our organizations, our communities, and our systems. Imagine. So I wonder what the panel feel. Um, what are your thoughts about some enabling organiza organizational structures that can support nurses working to scope with autonomy to lead improvement efforts and to find joy in work? Wow, that's a tall order, but I'm kind of going to address Lisa's comments and Tess's together because I think there's some synergies there for me. I mean, I think Joy and work, we absolutely like there's miracles that happen every single day in healthcare. Um, and all we hear about if we're reading the news or opening up the newspaper is the doom and gloom, right? The horrible things that are happening, the nefarious, you know, imposter nurse or the strikes or threatened, you know, the, the um, job action, things like that. And not at all to diminish the importance of uh, the labor movement, but we really need to celebrate the the wonder that is, you know, the the way that we are able to provide care every day, and and all of those stories of excellence, and amplify them, and find ways to amplify them. So I think, you know, to your question, uh, Lisa, I think, you know, Angela just shared this week at a conference with me at the Canadian Conference of Healthcare Facilities on the Innovation Lab. Um, and you know, having opportunities to embed an innovation in the structure, in the physical structure of a, of a healthcare facility, is just like a, a way to um, you know foster that creativity. I think that um, having nurses involved in decision making, whether it's shared governance, uh, nursing practice councils, you know, having nurses on boards and involved, it is a way to really tap into that expertise. And involve nurses in decision making. And you know, uh, to Tess's comments, first of all, I have to say, you're the first corrections nurse that I have ever spoken to that calls, calls the patients, not inmates and offenders, and it's very welcome uh, because they are our patients. They are people, right? They are people first. And uh, so, thank you for that. Um, and I think um, you know, one thing I heard a lot of last year when I was appointed into the role and. The, the workforce challenges were so acute. Um, 
was that while we have a resilient workforce and we're resilient, and we absolutely are, and we need resilient nurses, but we also need vulnerable nurses. And I think that we, we bypassed vulnerability and all of the nurses I had spoken to over the course of the last, or have spoken to over the course of last year, have said, stop calling us resilient. It's actually gaslighting our, ex our experiences that we had over COVID. We need to excavate that vulnerability and we need to have containers for it. We need to have services and resources. To, so even to your point around you know, dedicated seats, the dedicated seats don't work unless there's structures, unless there's representation, unless there's supports. And I mean, that's just in the post-secondary institution. It's also you know, it's a societal issue, but even in the post-secondary institution, if you can welcome you know, black, indigenous, Racialized people of color, you know, in in a in a warm embrace. It's not just the seats, right? It's it's also the wraparound supports, knowing that there's systems of oppression, there's structures that are actually going to impede their success every step of the way. And so you have to do extraordinary things to to make their journey um, that much more streamlined and smoother. So I think it's it's yes, resilience, but we need the resilient systems and structures. And we need people who can be vulnerable. I know that you know my own pathway to leadership has been marred with vulnerability. It's only through that vulnerability that you know I was able to find sort of my strength as an advocate, initially as a harm reduction advocate, and um, it kind of the professional and personal kind of meld at some point. But um, you know I think we need to have space for that vulnerability. And when we don't have it, then we have great pathology in nursing, and we're seeing that. We're seeing that with increased suicidal behaviors among nurses, increased um, mental health and addiction, um, and we don't have those bespoke services, I don't think, for nurses. So that's part of what the toolkit addresses is we need um, structures to be supportive um, of you know, the mental health needs of nurses. It's not just like yoga, pizza, you know, pizza lunch, <laughs> do some yoga, boba. It is like actual structures that we need. Um, and I'm glad nobody threw anything at me. <laughs> I mean, pizza doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Spread the word. <laughs> no, I, I love um, just the focus um, and the recognition of vulnerability. Uh, we, uh, through NFPBC, created these anti-stigma zones. So we had a dear friend, Spike, who has, you know, passed away because of an overdose. Uh, my girlfriend's brother died of an overdose. Uh, it's something that's very real. So we created the anti-stigma zone with the purpose of um, reaching out to nursing students. Because if we were expecting students to be vulnerable, uh, we wanted to, to demonstrate that. And so, um, you know, to this day, Greg, you know, and Wes, two of Spike's closest friends, meet with our students uh, several times throughout the program. And they're up there, you know, with their their hearts wide open, talking about everything that they've experienced. And it is such a bonding, tremendously powerful initiative. And so when we have the conversations with faculty, um, you know, we, we have an Indigenous curriculum advisor, which is wonderful. However, <laughs> you know, the, the first thing that people say is, okay, well, what, what language should I use in my course presentation? And it is so far from where we actually need to be to start addressing some of these issues and to recognize the layers of cultural shift change that you know is upon us but it, it's overwhelming but i think it's important to recognize the fact that it is these microscopic shifts that uh, you know like the way make a difference so yeah thank you um for just highlighting the vulnerability side of things i, I can't help but do my last segue um, around joy because when i first connected with carmen uh, on the phone um, around having a chat today with all of us. Um, the first words out of Carmen's mouth were, I love nursing. <laughs> and I said, I love nursing too. We're going to do great together. Um, so with that, uh, Carmen, I'd love for you to share um, what you'd like to bring forward today. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, 
I really to derail the train and turn it around. Um, so um, I've worked in um, all three three of the large hospitals in our um, interior health area. So with a, in a variety of positions, as you can tell from my resume. And I'm here to speak for the new graduate nurse. And I think that you that you have all summed it up very well. We have the individual who goes into nursing and is taught indigenous um, ways and respect for indigenous culture. They're taught to be joyful in their practice. They're taught to have tolerance for those who have abuse problems. They're taught to think about the environment and be sustainable. And in many cases, they come to work and set up programs. And then we give them eight to 10 patients each. And then we give them shifts where one RN on medical telemetry floor has 24 telemetry because everybody else on the unit is an LPN. Then we give the emergency nurses a one to eight ratio, sometimes one to nine, with nine of those patients being in a hallway. So I'm telling you that for the frontline nurse, which we were all, if you were a nurse in this room at one point in time, you were a frontline nurse. Um, I just can't begin to tell you how hard it is out there, which is why I'm still in, um, in my position at, at the hospital I'm at, is because every day I go up there and I look at those nurses and I'm grateful for them and I want them to know I'm there for them. Um, even though, as I make a joke about it, often I'm dealt two of them equal one of me. So um, it's I, what I'm bringing today is I was really pleased to see your your um, framework because it addresses three issues. And what I did was I went to Kelowna and I went to Vernon and I went to Kamloops, which is our age. And I asked nurses there in a group I was there doing different things about your framework, and I asked them what they thought, and they were absolutely overexcited about the burden, uh, administrative burden. And they all spoke to it, so you're right on there. They were all very excited about um, staffing, safe staffing, obviously, and they were very excited about scheduling. And so um, there's quite a few uh, in the nursing journals. I read the Continuing Journal of Nursing, and there's an excellent author named Demadio, and she often speaks to the issues of that. And what she says is that we have a real problem because we have a group of people who are looking at 215, an article came out and it said, is nursing a profession or an occupation? And that was a huge debate. But what I am seeing in, in my very small corner of the world in my reading is a group of people who graduate with a profession and the idealism of the profession and the gift of the profession and quickly it becomes an occupation. So that is in direct conflict with who they are. So when you see someone come in who has an overdose problem, instead of saying to them, you know what, I've got all these great clean meds I can give you, please don't choose something and overdose, we're here to help you. They say, oh my gosh, I've got another one of those overdose people here. That is a horrible shift for nursing. And when you have eight patients or nine patients and you're 21 years old and just graduated from nursing and haven't had time to build experience, we are going to a bad place. You leave nursing. And that's why your statistics are showing people who leave nursing. And if they stay in nursing, we create another problem because then we go into a specialty because it's easier and it's more controllable, but we don't bring with it the value of knowledge and experience. So then we have clinical specialists without enough education to mentor, because mentoring has proven, and we did, we hired personal mentors last year, we were a trial project for three of our awards, it made a huge difference to have a mentor on shift. So it used to be people like me, uh, nurses with experience, but they don't exist anymore. So the third thing that you said um, that's really important is mental health because these nurses are facing a moral distress every time they work. So thank you for looking at mental health. So my question to you is that when we these nurses go to graduate, they're graduating with a one to four patient ratio. They're graduating from a, from a program with who, that is preparing them with a one to four ratio, with a practicum, but still. And then the minute they graduate, they're up to one to nine, one to eight, and sometimes with three whole months of experience there's a nurse in charge. So I think that um, although we have a lot we can do, 
I think I'd like to ask you about one of the first things we have to look at is how we can narrow that practice theory gap, how we can support the new graduate in the workplace. And I, I really hope that the initiatives you're looking at, the self-scheduling, because they're all technology freaks, right? They all love technology. So being able to get control their work, if they have two little kids at home, would really help, right? Being able to give feedback, thank you, for you who suggested feedback. Being able to give feedback and be part of processes like you've indicated in your model, that's huge. And the ability to know what's happening would reduce their anxiety and the mental health support would reduce their anxiety. Because what I see is the nurses have tomorrow that are gonna look after me and they're really, really, really stressed. So I'm sorry, it's a huge soapbox, so I'll get off. <laughs> That's why you're here, Carmen. It's all good, good to see. I, it's a good soapbox. <laughs> um, I mean, I think a couple things. One, I think you've described really nicely how you're mentoring new grads, and that's that's why we've included this notion of return um, in the toolkit. Even though it's focused on retention, um, you know, we want to include return of nurses who may have left. We, you know, we had a record number of nurses in every jurisdiction during COVID who came back to do vaccination, to do yes. phone assessments. We need them to stay. We need their mentorship um, expertise. Um, and so organi some organizations have done that really well. Um, historically, there's been jurisdictions that have um, implemented like a late career nurse initiative where it's really intentional. Ontario is kind of resurrecting that with clinical scholars, I think they're called, but um, you know, bringing back um, that at the elbow support to the point of care. I know St. Paul's has that at Providence, and um, especially because of the novice composition of the workforce, but also the acuity that we're seeing. Um, and I do hope that with some of these preceptorship and mentorship opportunities, we'll be able to, we'll be able to narrow the very practice gap. I would say that we have a generation of nursing students who are very articulate about their needs, and I think that is a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is if they're not getting their needs met, they're you know jumping into something else. The opportunity is to harness that energy, right, yes. and to use it and tap into something into the positive system change. Um, but I, I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of work being done. Um, we need to look at the education programs as well and look at, you know, um, if there's a way to meet the entry to practice competencies and better prepare new graduates for, you know, the environment that they're going into. But I, I think your point as well around um, occupation versus profession is really interesting because nurses are employees in health. Yes, healthcare organizations or health authorities. It's very different from physicians, right, who are self-employed contractors in most organizations in a sort of fee-for-service model. And um, I think that there's, re I've seen wonderful opportunities of independent, autonomous, nurse-led practice. And this isn't nurse practitioners and APNs, this is RNs, LPNs, who are running the show in rural and remote and northern, um, northern areas. And I know a lot of my physician colleagues will say, like, there's no room for siloed practice anywhere. We can't have siloed community-based practice. Well, siloed practice exists all the time. It's just if it excludes physicians. <laughs> um, so I think, and this isn't an anti-physician <laughs> talk, uh, to be clear. Um, but I think that, you know, unless they're going to put a surgical center up on Baffin Island, siloed practice it's the nurses who are running the health centers, it's the nurses who are doing the medevacs, they're doing so safely, they're patching into the hospital in Calgary, they're patching into Chio or to Winnipeg, um, and this has been going on for decades, and they're, they're working very autonomously, and these are models that could be replicated. We don't see this in urban centers to the same extent. We see it in rural and remote areas, and we need to think about how we can replicate these models of nurse-led models in urban centers. Thank you, Lee. And thank you, panelists, for the issues you brought forward. Um, I'd like to give each of you perhaps one minute to share your last thoughts. I know it's a big ask in one minute or less on a Friday. Um, but starting, Carmen, with you, um, 
and hopping on down the line. One last thing that you would like to say to both the nurses who are here today, to Dr. Chapman, and the nurses who will be um, watching this discussion online at a future date. No pressure. No pressure. Um, I think that um, there's hope. I think that um, that we have a very thank you. You just described a very very professional who are capable of autonomous work, teamwork, research, uh, supportive work, intervention at any level. And I think now that we have a, a, a federal initiative and a provincial initiative that can work together and your framework, I think we now have a plan. I don't think I've seen such a comprehensive plan before. And you put it, it, it appears to be a great deal of thought has gone into this plan. And I like your themes. I think your themes are clear. And I think your themes are a good idea because individually, um, each buddy in this room may have it. Those themes be a few of them may really represent their group or the people they work with or the patients they, they work with. And so um, I think it's a start. I'm, I'm very encouraged. Thank you. I, I wish to run a different topic because I don't know what to say. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm so proud of the new new folks who are entering into our workforce. I worry because they're entering into a very unusual time, um, but I'm very proud of what they bring to the forefront. I love the role I get to play within our healthcare system as a clinical nurse specialist, because when I was bedside, we didn't have one, and so now I really take my role to you know use it to like, if somebody has an idea, I'm here to support you to make that idea happen and really see the innovation. And like there is absolutely great innovation that happens everywhere. Um, and uh, I, I kind of find my job is to make sure that the people who have those innovations, we showcase and shine them. Like um, from the, the conference that we had this past spring, um, the, the you know, when you're when you're a racialized nurse, how important it is to be visible. Like I you know, I used to go by Vinny a lot, and I still go by Vinny, but it does you don't can't tell what my race is if I go by Vinny. Um, so I'm starting to learn to use my full name so people can see me because how important it is to be visible, but also how important it is to be not the only one. Like have a network of people, which is what we learned in our conference this summer. Like don't have one person enter into a field where you're the only one. Bring a network and make that network support each other and 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 have reverse mentorship. Like you know, mentorship, you always think, you know, I'm the older person, you're the younger person, I'm gonna mentor you. Reverse mentorship is flipping that on the head. Take the younger person, make them our mentors, and then listen to what they have to bring to the table and show us what we don't see, what we're blind to, because we are, you know, middle-aged, older, and in, in positions of a bit of power, whereas new nurses are not, and racialized nurses are not. How do I talk that? <laughs> we, we, we don't talk much, right? Um, I, I remember being at an event years ago, <clears throat> sorry, and somebody suggested, you know, nurses keep just getting together and talking amongst themselves, um, and so nothing's going to change. Well, you know, things are changing. They're changing significantly um, because we've talked, but because we've developed these strategic ways of networking. Um, you know, your role is so critical for the voice of nursing. Um, I'm so proud to have had my tenure with NNPBC. Um, it's, you know, really switched things in this province. You know, we've become the, the first stop for government consultation. So I guess my point is, is keep talking. Keep um, living and sharing your passions. Um, I'm humbled to be in this room of mine so many incredible souls that are doing incredible work every day um, and um, you know let's take care of each other and, and be kind to one another so thank you for the opportunity um i would echo the kindness plea <laughs> because i think we need that um, and we need to bring humanity back into healthcare. and um, we can all do that in little ways every day, and so I certainly try to do that in my daily work. Um, I would say that um, after over 30 years as a nurse, um, there's no other work that I would want to do. I, it has brought me more gifts than it's taken from me in terms of energy and effort, and that's not to diminish 
people who have suffered and not been able to continue nursing. I would say, um, having worked in Emerge for quite a long time, I've seen people, good nurses, who, who couldn't carry on and because of the moral injury and uh, distress. And that's heartbreaking because um, these are great colleagues who were great nurses who did great work and, and supported their communities. And, and I think this retention strategy offers a lot to help um, mitigate that. So I'm very hopeful. And I would just say um, I'm, I'm unapologetically proud to be a nurse. And I think I'm amongst friends here. <laughs> um, and, um, and I think, um, yeah, I just, I, just the work that I've been inspired by uh, uh, from colleagues in all walks of uh, across acute community, any, any number of uh, programs. Um, there's just amazing work happening, and I think, you know, the, the, we can all learn from each other, and I think we just need to keep doing that, keep, um, as you say, like, um, you know, coming together, and, and our, our collective voice is, is so much more powerful, and I, I love that number of half a million, and I'm going to keep quoting that to people, so, so I just, I'm very hopeful, and um, I, I hope we can carry on holding each other together, so thank you, thank all of you, thank you for the opportunity. but we don't, I think we undervalue that. We, we think, okay, well, we may be, you know, developing a relationship with, you know, therapeutic relationship with a client, um, and we may be also advocating for ourselves, advocating for the patient, advocating for our colleagues, but I, I really do think that that advocacy and those relationships can transform the system, and, you know, we can see what happens in the world when relationships break down and when people are not in dialogue and not in conversation and I do really think that the, the, the power of nursing can change the world and, and I, I am filled with hope and filled with optimism that you know nurses have such a key role to play in society we have been devalued we have been invisibilized largely because the work is feminized um, there's a lot of reasons behind that uh, but I do think we have a time, we have a moment now where we need to be organized, we need to amplify the voices of nurses.